it was interesting. I didn't realize coming to Chattanooga, but this was my uh, first convention. That I don't. I think it was ten years ago, actually. And I came to video uh, for hoof watching. Just video the competitors. I didn't know what was going on. I had some DVDs to sell, and uh, was in the marketplace. So going through the hotel and looking at things that brings back. Uh, some memories. It's hard to believe it's been a 10 year run because since then I've uh, been on the American Bears team a couple of times, the WCB team, and at that time I didn't even compete. I remember going to the Gregory's and Cody was like, I don't know, 16 years old trying to teach me how to do a, a toe bend. But uh, that's how fast this 10 years has been in my life. And it's been great. I've been all over the world because of hoof watching, competing, and um, I've created a uh, and met so many great people, created a lot of friendships, and I'm still cultivating those friendships around the world. And you know, today with social media and all the things we have uh, access to, we can uh, remain uh, friends because, uh, like, you know, Craig tells stories about he, him going to England and having to drive over there with a map. You know, nowadays you have a GPS telling you, at the roundabout, Take your left, take your third step, you know, and you're just like, oh, because you're driving on the wrong side of the road. And uh, I can't imagine having to do it with somebody yelling at you from the other side, turn here, turn there, turn here, with a map. So things are, uh, things are, it's easier for you to be able to have communication and cultivate those relationships around the world today. So, but I'm excited to be here. This is a new talk for me, if you will. I put this together. It's something I've wanted to put together for a few years. Um, because I see, uh, you know, so many people making the mistakes as I made, and I continue to make some of these mistakes, but I'm working through that process of, of when you make a decision to become a competitor. And the things that I'm going to walk, walk you through, they will segue into your life, really anything that you look to accomplish in your life, because there is a difference between being good at something and being successful at something. And, uh, and we'll go through that as time goes on. And so becoming a more proficient farrier. And uh, I'm going to have to use some notes. And um, I'm also going to have to use my laptop because I am not proficient yet in giving this little talk. And so, you know, I, I had to look up what is proficiency. You know, it's a high degree of competence or skill. You're, ex you're an expert or you have expertise in something. So basically being proficient applies through Confidence derived from training and practice. Okay, what's the difference between those two? You know, training and practice. And so, so we can say here, you know, to gain that high level of confidence, you need that expertise uh, through training and practice. So today, this is education. This is your training. You're, you're getting your mind ready. You're getting your physical attributes ready. Getting those things ready to then go into to transfer that into a practice at home. You know, most, including myself, when I get ready for a contest, okay, what do I do? I just go to the shop, look on the prize list, see I need some three spot one, I need 11 inches of that, go to the end and try to make the shoe that's on the prize list. But I feel like that's a mistake for myself, and I feel like that's probably a mistake for other people as well. Because you have to walk through that process of getting your mind right and understanding what you do. And then tomorrow when you get out of here or next week or whatever, when you get into the shop, then that's when the practice comes. Once you've done all the things to train yourself and your mind to get ready, then you'll want to go practice. And, and to go practice is up to you, okay? And so basically, you know, you are what you repeatedly do. So we can say excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So how do you create a habit in your life? You know, how do you create those things that you want to do every single day? It takes like 21 days to create a habit in your life. That's like three weeks. So if you're just making a decision to maybe come here next year to compete in this competition, or you want a more successful shoeing business, or you want to do whatever you set up, you have to create that mental toughness to do it at least 21 days in a row to create that um, habit in your life you know because things have to be habitual or you won't do it right and so the things we're going to walk through is you have to have a strategy to win you have to have that belief system with that strategy or you're never going to win 
you're going to flounder. You're just not going to be able to do what you need to do. You have to have two, you have to have a knowledge of the opposition. And most of the time, especially in the competitive world, the opposition is you. Like for me, I'm slow. That's my opposition most of the time. If I could get an extra 10 minutes, I would probably do better, right? But tough. Most of the classes are 45 minutes to an hour, so you have to learn how to get through that. Uh, the resources you need. What do you need from resources to help create that success in your life? You've got to figure those things out before you ever make your first shoot. Because you've you got to have this stuff. This is resources right here. Steel, propane, those different things, those are resources that you have to have. But you also will have to have mental resources, right? We'll go through that in a second. These are all the things we want to break down in this talk. And then you have to have a plan to use those. And there are so many things that we've tried. You know, 10 years ago, I started a company called Hoofwatch. And I didn't even know what I was doing. And it's really morphed into something that's pretty cool. Craig and I have done a lot of videos. I've done videos. Mustad's been a big part of that. There's been so many people that's, that's been a big part of that. And, and, and it will help you learn how to use the resources to help you become successful in what, what you're doing. And then you have to have detailed communication. And men are bad communicators. That's just the facts, right? And I have to work hard to communicate my dream, my vision, the things that I'm going to do first and foremost with my wife, my family, right? And then, then the people that want to help you. Because there's a lot of people you'll find out that don't really want to help you. Uh, but there's a lot of people today because I think the, you know, it, it's changing. You can get more help than, you know, I just, I didn't compete 20 years ago, so I don't really know. But they said it was harder to get help 20 years ago than it is today. And so through some of the things that we've created and uh, some of the things that, you know, that are out there, you'll be able to get, get uh, a mentor, basically someone that can help you through that process. And you communicate your, your goals to your family, your wife, your mentor, the people in life that want to help you get where you want to be. And so, um, so with a strategy to win, you know, before I get to the dream part, there's a big, there's a huge difference between I wish I could do something and having a dream. You can stand in your garage for eight hours and wish you were a car, but you're never going to become a car. You can walk through the woods and be part of nature, but you're never going to become a tree. You can wish you were skinny, but if you don't die and work out, are you going to be that? You can wish you were as handsome as Brad Pitt, but are you, you know, those things are wishes. And, you know, you do that when you blow the candles out on your cake. But if you want something serious in your life and you want something that matters in your life, first thing you have to do, and some of you have heard me do a, my rain horse talk, and I talk about a big dream, you know, a, a good attitude, a great work habit, and a power of association. I'll blow through those things because they're so important. But they are. And the first part of that is to have a big dream. Like, you have to think big. Do you want to be a national champion next year? Then you have to dream it. You have to believe it. You have to want to fight for it. There, you know, and you have to know what you want, when you want it, what are you going to give up to get that dream? That's the biggest thing. What am I going to give up? Because you're going to have to give up something. Nothing great in life comes for free. And free not meaning financially, free from work and time, maybe resources, those things, but they're not free. And you're going to have to work hard. And if you want anything great in your life, you're going to have to really, really work hard to do that. And, uh, and you have to believe it. You have, to, you have to, uh, to speak it. You have to know. And how do you make that vision or that dream turn into a vision? Because action turns a dream into a vision. Without action, it's just a dream. Uh, it's almost like a wish. It's a wish on steroids, right? But to manifest that dream into a vision, you have to put action behind it. You have to start the process, okay? And to start the process, the first thing you need to do is to write goals down. You must write your goals down. Not just know them in your head. You have to write them down. You have to put them where you can see them every day. You need to put them on your mirror in your bathroom so when you're shaving, you can look at those, those goals and the first thing it says, I'm a winner. I can overcome. 
I can do things they tell me I can't do. I can be a national champion. I can get the qualifier done in 45 minutes. I can get the journeyman done in 45 minutes. I can do the things that people can say I can't do. I can do it because I'm a winner. And if you don't tell yourself that, you will never be one. And it may sound embarrassing, but you have to do that. Your goal is to be in your shop. And every time that I don't do these things that I'm teaching you, I, I just flounder around and wonder why I'm not growing or having more success. Because you get away from the basics. If you're fuller in a shoe and you forget to hem, and your branch looks like crap, then it's like, why is it like that? Because you didn't do the basics. Well, I'm teaching you today how to do the basics of getting your mind right so you can remember to do those stuff and it becomes subconscious in your mind. Because let me tell you something about your goals. If you don't communicate them, men, to your wives, what happens is, is that the, the work that it takes to sustain what you have to do to become a champion in anything, a champion in life, a champion husband, champion at work, champion in your church, champion in anything that you do in the, in the competitive world that we're talking about today, you have to have the backing and the love from your family because if you don't have these goals, you can't sustain any level of intensity for any amount of time. You're going to be like a, a Roman candle. <laughs> come out and all of a sudden you're done. Three months into it, you're done. I heard Bodie talk last night to the American Furious team and he's absolutely right. It's great today, but what is it three months from now? Are you going to have that same intensity three months from now? If you don't have your goals written down, you won't. You will not. And, and you have to. And in my house, and I'll talk for me, when my goals are written out and my wife and my daughter can see them and people around me can hear them, and I speak them. This is how it goes. Where's Chad this weekend? Because there's a lot of crawfish bulls going on where I live now. I have a lot of friends having them. My wife's going without me, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, where's Chad? Oh, he's practicing. Or he's doing something. I don't hurry him though. He's out of town. Really, what's he doing? Yeah, I really don't know. I don't know. He's somewhere in Kentucky or Tennessee somewhere. I don't even know. Really? Yeah. My, my daughter, Jane, she pops in. Yeah, he's gone all the time. He's never around. He's in this volleyball games and stuff we're doing. And I don't know what he's doing. He's just gone all the time these days. My friends, well, when's he coming back? Ah, oh, we don't know. He, he may be gone three days or a week. Okay, whatever. And so they go on, okay? That's without communicating my goals, right? Or my, my vision to them. This is when they know what I'm doing, where I'm going, my vision in life. Hey, where's Chad? Oh, he's in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He's judging the American Farriers Convention. Really? What's that? Oh, it's where they all come together, have a competition, he's lecturing. He's doing great things. He's, an, he's going to be an impact player in the industry. He's awesome. I'm so proud of him. My daughter. Yeah, he's, he's doing some really cool things. I don't really understand it, but we love him so much and we're proud he's paying the price. He's doing something great in his life. He's speaking in front of people and he doesn't really even like to do that. Oh, really? Wow, when's he coming back? He'll be back Saturday because I have a horse show and he's coming back to watch me show. See the difference of those two? When you communicate your goals with your family, then when it's just in your mind and you're in the shop just pounding around, you know, it's just, it's a huge, massive difference when you, when you share those things with your family. And you must do them if you want to sustain any level of intensity for any length of time. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm not going to go through everything I wrote down because I get really passionate about this and then end up going off on a rabbit trail. But there's a lot of things. Have you ever heard of a wandering generality? You're not wondering what you're doing. You're wandering around. Because like a river that takes the path of least resistance, if you don't have your goals in line and what you're doing, you're going to do the easy things in life. You're just going to skip out. So I think you should have short-term goals, mid-range goals, and long-term goals. And, and in the past, a long-term goal is like five years. Today, not five years. It needs to be about two years because of technology changes. Even in our industry, and I use Justin Fry as an example, the invention of the sandbox, right? It changed in one year. And in two years, the difference of the quality of the shoes that are, that are turned in, the feet, 
you know, some good things, some bad things, you hear everything. But the way we finish feet, the way we finish shoes changed in a single year. And so if you have uh, five-year goals, sometimes technology outruns you in today's marketplace. So, you know, I think if you write them down, you know, and, uh, and uh, you, uh, you need to do the short-term, mid-range, and long-term goals. So, have you ever heard of the 80-20 rule? You know, 80% uh, of the results come from about 20% 20, 20 of the people doing the work. And that's usually what happens. It's a statistical fact. And, uh, and so I want to be in the 20 percenters. You know, I want to do enough work to be in the 20 percent club because basically what this, what this rule says is that, you know, the vast majority of the people that enter up won't do the work that it takes to get there. And I've always wanted to be, in, you know, I've even had friends that talk about the 2 percent club, right? And, uh, and so I've always wanted to be successful. And so I tried to surround myself with not only the, the physical attributes I need, but the people around me to help me create that success. And so uh, let's get started in, in really working on yourself. You know, your biggest opposition most of the time is you. And you have to get around you to get through the process. And so, you know, lack of self-belief, lack of work ethic, you know, um, those things can be changed, right? You can change those things by doing, doing what we're talking about today. You know, you have to be teachable. You know, I see so many people ask for help. And not necessarily from me, but from even my friends. And all of a sudden they ask for help. And then they don't even listen. And then they're all of a sudden, before that person is done with the demonstration, this person is telling the person who's showing them, uh, what to do and why they're doing what they're doing. They're not even listening. So you have to become teachable. You have to get it in your mind that there are people that can help you go places, but you have to be teachable. And if you fight that, it's still going to be a very short period of time and they're not going to want to help you. I'm the nicest guy. I try to be the nicest guy in the world. When people treat me like that, I'm like, done. And it's just a it's a natural reaction to that. It's like, you want me to spend my time, which is valuable, to help you, and then all of a sudden, you're telling me what to do. You know, don't be that person. Don't be that person. Be willing to change and to trust the process. You know, if someone's teaching you to trust the process, then trust the process. They say, you know, Tobin, you know, branch, hint, all those things, trust it until you can do it. Well, I can't do it that way. It's because you're not practiced enough. Trust the process, all right? And then so once you say, hey, I'm going to come here next year and I'm going to compete, what do I do? You know, I think the biggest challenge that I have, and I had it this year, I did, I did the very thing that I'm teaching you not to do, so I'm not perfect, but I think that's why this is important. Because at the, uh, at the summit, there was a mail-in shoot, and it was a sideboard shoot, and I, lo I, lo I like making them. And so Craig, Craig made it. And I just pulled it up on the internet, glanced at it. I can make that. Which side is it? Knew what side, how many nails? I can make it. Send it in, thought it was a nice shoe. Send it in. Don't even hear another thing. To get a blue shirt and melts that I was a participant, right? So, whatever. But I looked at the shoes online and I knew instantaneously that I didn't study the picture. My el one of the elements was in the middle of the section. His was on the inside branch of the section. Stephen Bean sent one in. Beautiful shoe. Those of you that know him, he can forge absolutely beautiful shoes. Uh, it didn't win. And then you look at Joe Nygren's, and he actually won. And it was because he studied the picture. His specimen looked just like the specimen in the picture. And it's like, so study the picture. I put this picture up here because this is my fellow judge, Paul Robinson, who's a world champion, champion of champions, most awesome, you know, guy, right? And those pictures right there are shoes I made. This was for the European Championship last year, so I put that in there. I thought it was pretty cool. I have Paul Robinson on the other side of the world, Northern Ireland, and he's got my pictures up on the wall. So you have to look at the pictures. You have to study the specimen, especially for this contest. You have to make sure that you understand, you know, what the specimens are and what they look like. So study the elements. Uh, 
find the small details in the shoes, right? Talk to your friends. I mean, we have a huge network of people that do the same thing that we do. Talk to your friends, you know, um, you know, or someone you trust, you know, and then as you're building the resources, this is now the resources that you need. Then, then figure out the size of steel that you need and start, uh, you know, buying the steel, the propane, the coke, figuring out what, what you need and the tools you need to help you through the process. And then when you break down, when you break down, um, you know, your practice, you know, have purpose in your practice. Don't just go in there and waste time. Because if you are time challenged as it is, don't go in there and just waste time. Have a system in place that will help you do your practices. You know, and get a mentor. Get someone in your life. It is so valuable. Like, you know, even with anything that you're doing. I told someone yesterday, you know, uh, I've been blessed to have been asked to judge a lot this year. But I could not have done it without the people that I think are mentors in my life. Austin Edens, Craig, people that I trust that's done it for years. It's like, oh my gosh, what do I do? And they help me through the pitfalls of what not to do is just as important as what to do. And you have to have those people in your life because experience is not always the best teacher. Evaluated experience is the best teacher, right? Evaluated experience. Okay, Chad, don't do this. Watch out for this. When you get 9,000 shoes and a bucket in there, you know, just start working them out like this. You know, those things have helped me through the process. And and you have to have those mentors in your life to help you through the minefields of everything. Because as you will find out, if you're serious and committed to being a competitor, that it transcends your life. It is, you become someone different, which is awesome. You live to, and your family becomes part of the competition world. It's another extension of your life. I have friends at home. I have family at home like you all will. But I have family here. I love people here. And I would not have had that if I didn't make the decision at 41 years old for Cody Gregory showing me how to make a Tobin. I mean, I was 41 years old. And the only thing I'd ever really made was a rain plate. And I had a machine that punched the nail holes for me. You know, 10, 11 years ago, I had one pair of quarter inch tongs. I didn't even have a hammer that was worthy of being one. <laughs> I didn't have punches and pritchels. And I had a pritchling machine I, and I had a headstand, literally. And I had, a, I had a couple of shoes my buddies gave me, of me teaching them how to fuller, and it was horrific. And so things can change in your life in a very short period of time if you will do some of the things that I'm teaching you today and you, and you work hard, right? And, uh, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over and over and expecting different results, right? And so I use that here because insanity to me is staying in the shop in the summertime in Texas when it's hot. You know, when I'm missing my, my Jade's uh, athletic stuff, when I'm, you know, just working hard and I keep making the same mistakes. I send pictures to my friends, my mentors, if you will, and say, what do you think about this shoe? What do you think about this shoe? And sometimes pictures don't always do them justice, so if they're ever around, I'm like, what do you think of this shoe? I rarely, no, I don't know that I've ever given a shoe as a specimen or maybe for an auction or something like that without having one of the people who I consider a mentor in my life look at it. Because you need that help, right? And so, you know, uh, I'd hate to make a million shoes or a thousand shoes, as it says here, you know, with making them wrong. Um, so when you really think of insanity and you think of things that are insane, it's like doing that thing over and over and over again and not having any results. So, okay, let's move on to scheduling practice time. You have to put it in your calendar. You have to. It's like anything else that you do. You have to schedule time to do it. If you have, say you're going to so-and-so's farm today at 8 o'clock, do you miss that appointment? No, why? Because it matters to you. It matters financially. It matters of your credibility. Am I a horseshoe that never shows up? Are they going to be talking about me at lunch about not showing up on time, doing all? No. I'm a man of my word. When I say I'll be at your house six weeks from now at 8 o'clock, I show up, right? So guess what? When you're setting a goal, it's got to be that important to you that you get in the shop. And to get in the shop, you need to have that time in your calendar. And it needs to be every day. Fast forward to what we said. You know, you have to create a habit. 
you have to make yourself do it. And if you don't have every day, that's fine. But you need to do it as much as humanly possible. And don't shortcut the process. Because if you shortcut the process, don't expect the result to be here when your work habit is down here. It'll never get there. And it will take years and years and years and you'll be frustrated. You'll say, well, it doesn't work. They don't like me. The shoes are too big. You know, the judge said mine was bad, but he needs to put on his glasses. See, I wear my glasses here, right? But anyway, so you have to have put that time in the calendar. And you have to sit down with your family and say, listen, family, you know, if this is something you guys are going to be on board with me, this is what I'm going to do. From 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock every night, I'm going to be in the shop, okay? So don't plan on me going to our neighbor's house and doing this at this time because it's going to make me make a decision. And most of the time, you're going to be mad at me and I'm going to be mad at you because I said I was going to be in the shop and you wanted me to go to this birthday party. You know, and it's like, so you have to schedule that time, put it on your calendar and do it every day, you know, and let, let your family know the time invested, the money invested, the things that you're going to be going on weekends, learning how to do, you know, what you need to do to get this process done. You have to communicate that very well and continually communicate with them because they forget, all right? It's your dream, all right? And so I just wrote down a little bit of how to practice because you want to practice your shoes on, you know, on a weekly basis. You don't want to just go in there and make a roaster. Everybody wants to make a roaster. You know, it's like, well, make a roaster. You can't even make a caulking or a wedge. Why are you going to make a roaster? You know, practice the elements before. It's just like somebody working out. They're all chest and no calves, right? Because all they want to do is bench press. And you look at them and they're big up here and their legs are like this big around. It's the same with practicing here. Everybody wants to do, make a roaster. I get it. I want to as well. But there's a lot to it. It's one of the most difficult shoes to make. So why in your first practices are you going to do that? There's a lot of other shoes in this competition here that, that you have to make well to do well here. The Roadster is simply one shoe. And so you have to sit down and say, okay, Monday. Have you ever seen anybody or have you ever worked out? You don't just go in there every day, okay, I'm going to work this. You have chest and tri, back, lats you know, legs, you have it written down and you go in there and check mark or Tuesday I'm doing this and Wednesday. Do your practices the same way. You know, I know Chris Madrid told me, he's like, I'll warm up every day, Bodie too, and they're both national champions. Hey, imagine that. They warm up with a journeyman pair. Then they make something else. So that's why I put that on there. You don't have to do the whole class. Just make a pair of shoes first and you can put them in your truck and nail them on something and then make some of the specialty shoes. There's six of them now, they pick three, right? So each day makes something different, you know? And if you want to, if you're struggling with the Roadster, then make wedges, just cut half by one, you know, make wedges, make wedges, make wedges, get help, make wedges, make wedges, get help, make wedges, make wedges, get help, make wedges, make wedges, get help. That's the only way you're gonna do it. That's the only way. And when you figure out how to make a wedge, then start making a caulking. Make a call and make a call and get help. Make a call and get help. Make a call and just put, you know, send them to your friends or your mentor. Say, why is this talking like this? Why is it like this? Why is one side longer than the other? Why is it not symmetrical? Why does it, doesn't it fit in the golden means? And they can help you where to hit it, where to turn your arm. We worked on that in Amarillo, right? It's like, and if you'd have been left up to yourself, taking you deaf, you'd have never figured it out. Why? I believe this. You can't teach yourself something you don't know. You can't teach yourself something you don't know. So when you're at the anvil, you don't know what to do, stop, get help, because you're never going to teach yourself. You're going to waste your time, your steel, and everything. Once you have it, then you have to practice. Don't get me wrong. You have to practice. But if you don't know what you're doing, then just get some help. There's a lot of people willing to help. And so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if you want to do five days a week, you want to do every other day, your schedule only allows a certain amount of time. It's up to you, but you have to schedule your practice time in, okay? And then once, once you have all the mental stuff put together, then you get down to your tools. It's funny, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I did the same thing, is early on, because it was later in my life, I could financially afford to buy tools, and I bought all these tools, I didn't know how to fix them. If they mushroomed, I just bought another one. 
But man, get some help. Learn how to have tool maintenance. There's no reason for that. There's a lot of guys out making tools today, especially punches and pretzels. And get your tool preparation right. If you're in the journeyman class and it fits a five slim blade and you're troughed in that fuller now, it's the wrong fuller. Right? It's the wrong fuller. Find something that fits what the picture says because it does make a difference. And if you can't afford tools, man, get with some people. There are so many great people in this industry. And, you know, don't be embarrassed. Go to their house. Get some H13. Robert Jukes, he's, he can make, there's a million people that make fullers. You know, Austin's got great fullers. There's a lot of people that have fullers today that can help you get a fuller that will that do a thin crease for your five slim blade. Then you go to some of the other shoes and you need a wide fuller for an e-head e nail. Make sure you're set up. When I went over to England and Billy Crothers, we did the concave video. He said that his first day of school, his first day of school, they set it up and they cut a nail. And then he, then he took a punch and put the nail on the punch to make sure it was the right size. And then took a pritchel and matched the two up. Imagine that. Match the pritchel with the punch you're going to use. And said, hey, this pritchel will fit this nail. Because if your pritchel is smaller than the base of your stamp, then it's going to be wallered around. You're probably going to break your pritchel. Make sure they match up. Make sure things in your punching nails for a five slim blade or an E-head e eight. There's different ones. And your tool preparation is everything. You can't have success unless you have good tools. Okay? Uh, learn to maintain your tools. Fit your tongs. I didn't even know what that was. Like all these things I knew because these are the mistakes I made. Like I had one of everything. You know, we go to the WCV contest and the novice class have the, the worst punches. Why? Because they haven't been taught. The, before they just go in the shop and start beating on things. And nail fit usually decides the shoes. Nail fit is huge. And so, you know, make sure when you're fitting tongs, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that make tongs. There's a lot of people that will help you. Because if you can't hold on to it, you can't forge it. Simple as that. If you can't hold on to your draft shoes in this class coming up in a few days, if you can't hold them, it's hard to put heels on them. The Roadster, if you can't hold that thing, it's hard to forge it. Your journeyman shoes. If, you're, if your uh, tongs are too tall and you're squeezing the whole time, you're going to burn your tong hand out. It's got to fit. So it's very, very important. Okay? And... Um, you know, we're going to go through this, and I think I'm getting close on time, but, uh, you know, you need to start making shoes, okay? Now, through the process of getting your, men your mental state right, now you get in the shop, you start making shoes. Cut bar stock. I, I dislike cutting bar stock when I'm going to make a shoe. You know what's the easiest to make? 11 inches, a half by one. What's that? The Roadster. All chest, no calves, right? I, it's easy. So... I cut it up, and when I had help at home, I had them cut it up. <laughs> and they were waiting on me, you know, to get ready to go. If I was on the phone or something, I'm like, you know, cut the journeyman bar stock. Cut the specialty forging bar stock. Have me pieces, because when you go in the shop, right, you got two hours. If you spend the first 30 minutes getting ready to practice, then all of a sudden you have an hour and a half. And then you're running late. And I used to run late all the time. I'd be like, oh, I need to be in by 8, and, you know tuck the kids in and stuff and, and so it'd be like man it's 7 45 and i just need to finish this shoe all of a sudden i look up it's 10 after 8. ah you know so i had to learn to have stuff prepared get ready get in there get a fire built for the convention it's propane so it's a lot easier but you got to build a coke fire get it going and get with it go to work money always says chad it's time to go to work you know and i love that because it's true it's time when you're in there it's not play time it's work time and you, if you have that mentality, you will, you will be successful, okay? You know, and build and building your shoes, build three to five shoes, you know, then judge yourself. I'm practicing for a contest later in the fall, and I have all these shoes. I have a big table, and I've made them all different sizes, and I judge them, and I look at them all the time. And I'm like, oh, I hate those. I hate those. I need to work on this. I need to work on that. Be honest with yourself. That shoe's wrapped. That shoe's not not right and they're laid out on the table if you just throw them in a pile you can never look at them again because you won't go over there i lay them all out on the table and they'll be laid out from now to september because i want to see if i'm having a progression because if i'm not if i'm going backwards or i'm staying the same 
I'm changing because I'm not making all these shoes for, for, for zero purpose. There is a purpose in my practice. So make three to five shoes, judge yourself, send pictures to your mentor. You know, uh, I, I, I put that in there because if you put them out on social media, you're going to get what you get. You know, it's not, <laughs> I don't think that that's a great place to do that, honestly. If you have a cool shoe and you want to put it on Facebook, go for it. But when you're in the process, you have to protect your mental state. I'm a winner. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to do it. This is my deal. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to do things that can't be done. I'm going to get, I'm going to get fast. I'm going to make high quality shoes. But if you have somebody on Facebook say, that's a piece of crap. All of a sudden, boom, negative. Negative starts, negative starts, negative starts. It's just you let that negative in and it's your own fault. Don't do that if you can't handle it, right? Because things that you think are great, regardless if they are or not, it goes out to the world. And you will, I mean, I don't even look at the comments most of the time because it's like you get the good and the bad. So I won't go any further on that. But and when you have challenges with certain things, if you have challenges with the caulking, stop making a roadster. Stop. All you're doing is wasting your time, your elbow, and your steel. Get help making the elements and then go back to making, you know, pulling clips. The simplest pulling clips is still hard for open competitors. There's only one human being that I've seen that looks like they never miss. Gene Leaser calls me lightning. Why? Because I never hit the same spot twice. Right? And it's like my clips are everywhere. And I'm like, and I still struggle with that. So when you're struggling with certain aspects, stop making the whole shoe because you're wasting it. Get a box of shoes. Clip them up for your truck. Practice doing those things. You know, if you're making handmade shoes, you get through the process. What's the last heat? The clip. You make the whole shoe and then you're ruining it with the clip? Makes no sense. Get some junk shoes, get some anything and just practice. Cross beam, cone hammer, you know, bob punch, whatever. They're all different techniques of doing that, you know. We probably got videos out on that. You know, I know we do somewhere. So just try to get some help. Look them up online. Uh, and then when you get your heats down in your shoes, so you're far into your practice now. When you get your heats down in your shoes, what are we, how are we doing on time? Huh? How much time do I have left, you know? A half hour? 20 minutes? Sorry, I put my phone up there. And uh, But when you get into your heats uh, and you start understanding the process, trusting the process of your shoemaking, you know, and you're rolling through there, then at that point, you know, you can start putting a clock on yourself. But if you can't make a good shoe in two hours, why are you going to put a clock on yourself for 45 minutes? You're just going to tear down all the things you've been trying to build up, right? Because if you can't do it in a long period of time, you sure ain't going to do it in a short period of time. So those are the kind of things that you have to use your brain power to start to figure out about yourself. And I'm talking about me. All these things are mistakes I've made and I struggle to not to continually make. Because you just want to get in there and you think you get to a certain level of competitive uh, whatever. You get to be an open competitor, if you will. And you can just skip all these processes. And I've done it. And guess what? There, you just don't have success. So when you start putting a clock on yourself, say the journeyman class. Okay, you've made pairs. You've made front pairs and hind pairs, and front pairs and hind pairs, and front pairs and hind pairs, and front pairs and hind pairs. Okay, you get it down. So now you put a clock on yourself for 45 minutes. Then you see what you can get done in the time period that they're going to give you next door, right? And so that you start that process. And then the first time you have crappier shoes than you did in your warm-ups, but yet you're done in 45 minutes. So you build on that. You build two or three of them, you judge them yourself, you send pictures, you figure out what you're doing, and you learn how to cut time on heats. Most of the time, these guys are building these shoes in four heats. They're bumping and turning. They're building each branch. You're putting a heel on it, fulling it, punching Pritchell on one side, putting a heel on, full it, punching Pritchell on the other side, pull a clip on it, and then they're done. So you can't get away from taking away a heat. There's no heats to take away. If you're building a single shoe in the specialty class and you got it to 10 heats, okay, I'm doing this in one heat and say it's 10 heats, then maybe you can do two things in one heat 
and get away with a heat and time your heats. Okay, is a heat a three minute heat? Is it a two minute heat? Is it, you know, a four minute heat? When you're bumping, if you've got to bump an inch in, it might be a full two, two and a half minute heat. If you're putting the heel on, fuller punch and pritchlin, it might be a three minute heat. Start breaking down that process to figure out where you're at. But until you can do it well, slow, then don't, don't, don't do these things. But we've already made them good slow, now we're learning how to make them good fast, right? And there's people in this room that can really make shoes fast. And, uh, and I'm sure through the process that they didn't just wake up one day and be so speedy. They had to break this stuff down. When you're building bar shoes, um, you know, you have to take, is, are you going to weld it in one heat? Are you going to have two welded heats? Are you going to have three welded heats? You know, and all those things you have to start breaking down. And in the process of in your shop, that's where the research and development takes place. And that's where you work hard and your friends work hard. And then you have your other friends that don't work hard. Then they come over and they steal all your ideas and then they make better shoes than you. <laughs> but uh, that happens, right? That's when you're secret. It's uh, but you just work with your buddies and, and then you help each other because not you can't be up every single day of your life, right? And so it takes building relationships to help you bounce back and forth. In the last year, myself and Chris Madrid, we've we've been reading some of the same stuff and talking, and it helps me actually. He's helped me create that excitement again because you know you let you let doubt and fear and you know, those things come into your life. Anybody can can be a victim of that, right? Including myself. And it's like with my age, you know, things that I can't overcome, I don't think. And then all of a sudden you have people in your life that help you overcome those things. So when you're shoe building and you have trouble and you can't get them done, you don't think in four heats. It's like a three heat uh, draft shoe. A lot of these guys are doing it. I didn't think I could do it. And Robert Dukes and I did the two-man draft two or three years ago, and he's like, mate, you gotta do it. I'm like, I can't. You have to. So guess what? We built them as fast. You know, whether they were they good or not, I don't know. You know, we ended up in fifth place or sixth or something, but out of 40 some odd competitors, so I felt like it was pretty good for me because I struggled with that. There's a lot of things I personally struggle with, you know, in the speed part of building shoes, and that's why I wanted to put this stuff up here because this is what happens. And so about a month out, maybe six weeks out, you start running the classes. You know, don't run the classes a year in advance. You'll burn out. You will burn out even six months in advance. Don't, you know, try to stay away from running the classes and just try to build nice shoes. But when it gets to be about a month to six weeks out and say you can practice every day and you can build a pair and the roadster class, a pair and two. So when you really see how many practices you have left before you come to the big show, you realize six weeks is not that many, you're not gonna make that many shoes, right? I mean, we're already practicing for contests. Me personally, I have a pile of shoes for one in September, but it's a big one, right? And so, uh, um, you know, you have to start looking on how many, so four to six weeks out, start running the classes. You know, put a clock on you, 45 minutes, this is my journeyman, because it takes a lot out of you. You can run a class and then build a shoe or two, right? But here you have to do two classes in a day, so I recommend to do that because then you get your physical, you know, you get accustomed to doing that. So once you get your uh, four to six weeks out, you start running classes, put a clock on yourself, lay them out, judge them, leave them for a week or so. If you need to put them on a horse, then take them and put them on a horse, but try to leave your practice shoes out for a short period of time, if you can, to judge them, to make sure you're going up, not down, you're staying the same, you know, because I have trouble like on those hinds not to wrap them. The lateral branch is coming down the nail holes a little bit. And so I'd look at my shoes and all of a sudden I'd overcorrect it and the medial would be down. And I'd be like, what am I doing? And so I laid those shoes out there because if I nailed them on a horse, then I would forget, or forget that. Okay, what did I do to keep this? You know, if my shoe comes down and out and around, this is always going to be lower than nails if you caliper in the toe bend. So just ink it up just a hair, you know, and then it'll be in frost. So uh, just little things like that that'll help you through the process. Because when you sit there and do it yourself, when you learn to judge yourself and are honest, and then all of a sudden your mentors say, hey, this shoe's right, this one needs this. And you go, I knew that, I knew that, I can see that. 
and all of a sudden you start building that confidence that when you're at the anvil and you're in the class and you're making those shoes that you can judge them while you're building this doesn't look right because if it doesn't look right it's probably not right correct you know so you're in that process and so you know um you have to you have to get in that process because if you practice like you're going to play you'll have success in the arena but if you just lollygag around there's there's people that i know that kind of lollygag and they bring it on the day but those people are rare i'm not one of them my friends can tell you that i don't like change i don't i mean it's got to be you know and i'm working through that because it's not necessarily a good characteristic of mine and it's like things have to go if i break a, if i break my favorite fuller in the first pass i'm smoked i am so i have two of them that i like so i always bring another one because if that happened it's hard for me to just on the fly adapt and competing especially like last week at the classic the teams that did well had the ability to adapt on the fly that is a good characteristic characteristic i possess i'm in the process of changing because it's not necessarily good okay but if you can change on the fly if you see things if the judges give you certain things that you need to change because of the, what they like change them on the fly you know because they're judging it's their opinion this week it's not necessarily saying myself and the two other judges are better than anybody else but this week we've been asked to give our opinion and so we're going to get it and so if there's things that you know about us that we like then do it you know but study the pictures it goes back to the pictures because we're going to go off the pictures right because that's what you've been practicing so you know, uh, and then uh, detailed communication, okay? And we, we've talked about, uh, let me see, I'm going to go one more, this very last one, and then we're going to be, I can open it up for, for uh, any kind of question that you have. You know, as you communicate your goals, you write them down, you speak with your mentor, you speak your vision, you know, all these things, you know, are, are going to help. The communication part we've talked about everything here and communication to not only your family but to your friends your mentors those people that you're going to stand shoulder to shoulder with you know what's cool about this is that we have friends there's friends in this room i'm not competing here but are going to compete against one another and when that bell rings they're not friends for an hour <laughs> they want to beat each other bad but when the bell goes off they maintain that friendship. How cool is that? You know, because they've helped each other. They've spent their lives in the shop. Other guys have boats and fit and you know pictures of big fish and all this. What do we have? You know, dirty hands and a, a smoky shop, right? And it's like you just got to decide where you want to invest your life because it's not saying you can't go fishing, you can't go hunting, you can't do these things. But when you're focused on a goal, sometimes you have to delay your gratification understand that you have to have delayed gratification you have to delay those things in life to achieve the goals and you will never do it unless your goals out there and and I, I struggle with it. I love to hunt and I had some friends of mine going on a big elk hunt this year guess when it was September and I made a commitment to go to the go to Calgary in September and and I need to practice way more than a lot of people do and so I had to you know this was the elk hunt of a lifetime and I gave it up you know, because hopefully I live another year and I can go some other time. Maybe that elk will go from 360 inches to 400. So, you know, I, you know, it's just things and you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to give up things in your life. But if you don't communicate your goals to first yourself, you know, put your goals on your mirror, put your goals in your shop. You know, if you don't write them down, it's a waste of time, honestly. Uh, you know, if you don't speak to those people, if you don't speak your vision, you don't have a great attitude, you know. And, and the, having a great attitude is a lot of, and, and the power of association is so huge. You have to surround yourself with like-minded people. You have to. Because people that don't want your success are no more than like, you know, if you have a bucket full of crabs, you don't even have to put a lid on it. Why? As soon as one of those rascals put their claw up and try to get out, their friends are pulling them back down. Guess what? That's kind of life with negative people. You try to get somewhere in life, you try to get a better business, you try to do things, and all of a sudden, if you're around the wrong kind of people, they just continually pull you down. 
So guess what? You got to get out of that bucket. You have to surround yourself with people that will help you get to where you want to go in life. This is beyond. This is just transcends competition. If you want a successful marriage, you want to be successful in your community. You want to have a successful shoeing business. You have to surround yourself with people that will sow into you, that will help you develop those things. And the power of association is so huge, it's unbelievable. And, uh, and speaking your vision builds accountability. You have to be accountable. You know, when I'm around farriers, we're, we're some of the most accountable people. My friends that are farriers are. Why? Because they get up every day when they don't have a boss. And they go to work every day because they don't have somebody telling them they got to punch a clock at 8 o'clock. I've done it my whole career. You know, I've prided myself on being someone that's accountable. You say you're going to be there six weeks from now at 8 a.m., go. Why? Because my accountability is on the line. It has nothing to do with you, really. It's When I look in the mirror, I want to see a winner. I want to shave a winner's face. I want to shave a successful, you know, person's face. I want to, and I hope you do too. You know, if you, if you don't do those things in life, they, they kind of take those little chinks in your armor, if you will. Oh, they take away, you hear this negative, you, you know, and the power of association, being accountable keeps that away from you. You know, speaking your vision, you know, and having a good work habit. Man, people that work hard, man, that's Americana, right? That, that is so awesome when you're around people that are hard workers and do things in life and that are successful. I love being around those kind of people at, at all levels. And then, you know, the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is simply the word extra. It's kind of funny. It's kind of simple, but it's huge. Because if you want to be something great in life, you have to do something great in life. You have to work hard. You have to have a big vision. You have to be part of the 20 percenters or really 2 percenters. You, you have to do the things that we talked about tonight to be extraordinary. If you don't, you'll just simply be an ordinary person, which for you, if that's okay, that's okay. But I promise you, every aspect of your life, whether you're male or female, will help. Because you attract people. Your wife, your husband will be proud of you if you're extraordinary. You go the extra mile. You do the extra things. You do things that you're scared of. You get out of your comfort zone. You do the things we're talking about. You speak your goals. And you do some of these things that we talked about. I promise you. She will want to jump your bones. He will want to jump your bones. He will love you. Your marriage will be successful in all aspects of your life. Will grow and flourish. And people, you will be a magnet for people. And um, and I want to end with that. I don't know if I have more time. But if you have, you guys have any questions, I can open that up. If not, uh, I, I just don't want to run over anybody's time. But that's all I have. And thanks for having me. And it was uh, it was awesome to be here. I usually go over, I know, but this is my first time. You did great. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions for Chad? Okay. just getting started um, making shoes that are practical not just things that are impractical that just go in a pile right I think I think it's the mindset because everything in a roadster he used a roadster as an example he's interested in making shoes that he can nail on a horse which I totally get but the aspects of building a roadster is something that really encompasses most all shoes you'll ever make it's the practice of upsetting or bumping. You bump the toes in the shoes you put on horses. The roadster is, is drawn this way and this way, right? So anytime you have to draw a shoe to fit, that's, a, that's something that goes into building normal shoes. You know, you may not put a caulking or a wedge on a regular shoe, but you'll pull a clip. You'll stamp a nail. Most of the things in a roadster are in all shoes. You know, it's great practice. It really is. And so that's what you have to use. You know, 
uh, make a pair of shoes you can put on a foot. Practice that. And then make things that are out of your comfort zone. Because you will have an investment of time and money into just shoemaking in general. I put them in a pile, take them to the scrapyard, get two or three hundred bucks, and then I go buy bar stock with it. Honestly, that's what I do. And I have big bins at my house, and I put a forklift in them and take them. You know, now I have a dump trailer, and I just dump them all in there, right? Because I got tired of making the boxes. But yeah, you know, and, and just know that when you're making shoes, have a purpose for your practice and make things you can put in the truck, but some of those shoes will help you make your shoes for your truck. They really will. Any other questions? Awesome. Thanks. Chat chance, everybody.